Hi, Dr. Fox, and thank you so much for being with us here virtually. Uh, we're really sad to miss sad to miss having you in person at Yale. There are so many people who are really looking forward to having you with us throughout this whole week, but we're delighted that we can still connect virtually um, during this week, which would have been the fourth annual Gazelle Lectures on Lifespan Development with you as our 2020 Gazelle Lecture Visiting Professor. You have built a career of studying children's brain development from developing methods to measure brain activity in children and adolescents to using that basic research to identify the underpinnings of clinical anxiety and to designing and studying interventions for children who are experiencing some of the most severe forms of neglect, your Bucharest Early Intervention Project. And throughout your career, you've helped us learn that significant neglect can profoundly affect children and their brain development and also put them at risk for developing cognitive deficits and psychopathologies. But the great thing about your work is you've also shown us that children can be rescued if they're given quality care and love and comfort, particularly from an early age, they can largely be rescued um, from the effects of this type of early adversity. And unfortunately, although we can't have you talk about uh, this fascinating work in person in depth this week. We will be having you come back in person at a future date. Um, so although we can't hear you talk this week because of the pandemic, we're eager to hear your thoughts about this unprecedented time. And my first question to you is, do you think the COVID-19 pandemic is an early life adversity? Oh, for sure, I think it is. Um, I think it's, um, and the diversity for many people, not just for children, but also for adults. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that <clears throat> we've studied intensively in the Bucharest study uh, is the idea of sensitive periods, critical periods in development, which are times that experience has a profound effect mm -hmm. on uh, the brain, on the developing brain. So um, as we were talking about just before we started this recording, in my work, uh, my longitudinal uh, temperament work, we're studying, uh, we're following a sample of uh, children. They're not children anymore, they're adolescents, mm -hmm. 15 year olds. And it occurred to us almost immediately that uh, these kids, they range in age from 16 to 18 now, mm -hmm. they are in the midst of uh, this uh, important period of adolescence where social relationships are so important. Yes. We're thinking about the future in terms of defining yourself uh, and what you're going to be doing becomes important. And all of that is now uncertain. Uh, their ability to interact with uh, others, significant others, peers, mm -hmm. uh, is hampered. Now they have Zoom, as we all do, <laughs> but I've been reading about Zoom fatigue. Yes, um, very rude. And there is, something, there is something to that. And although, it's great to be able to connect uh, over a, a medium like Zoom. There's really nothing like uh, interpersonal interaction uh, with uh, individuals who are in proximity to you and they're mm -hmm. being denied that. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for the important transition period of adolescence, um, this is a particularly difficult difficult period of time. And that uh, leads into my next question, which is, do you think there are some children or adolescents that we should be um, particularly looking out for during this time and why? Yeah, so that's a, uh, uh, an important question for us as well. And I'll, I'll uh, tell you the hypothesis that we have, but, we're, but we, and that we are collecting the data on it right now, but we don't know. So as you know, we've been studying a temperament called behavioral inhibition for some time. 
Um, these are uh, uh, children who we can identify early in life who have this particular temperament. And having this temperament increases the odds of a, a child with that temperament for developing anxiety and particularly social anxiety. Mm -hmm. So the incidence of social anxiety in our sample, that sample that I was just talking about of adolescence, is uh, much higher than it is in uh, a community sample in, in a typical population. So now all of a sudden we are hit with the pandemic and these kids along with other kids are forced to be at home. Yeah. And so the question is, how are they doing? Is it actually easier for them now that they're home right. and they, are, they don't have to uh, interact in the social groups that they would in high school mm -hmm. if they were going, going to school? Um, or is it, does it exacerbate their level of anxiety because of the high degree of uncertainty? And we think that uncertainty is a trigger Mm. in these kids for uh, anxious, anxious behavior. Very interesting. So we don't know. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. And do you think you might be able to learn during the course of this pandemic? Are you? Um... Yeah. So with funding that we've gotten from the vice president for research at the university, mm. um, we have uh, developed a set of questionnaires and are using one of the many COVID questionnaires that are out there uh, in the research ether. Um, and we are, uh, we have sent the entire sample, um, uh, that questionnaire, that COVID questionnaire, and a set of questionnaires to assess their mental health uh, and their stress mm -hmm. level um, and uh, asking them to identify what resources they think are missing in their lives in terms of coping with this particular stress. We just started it. We finished the first week, first data point of collection. We're going to be doing it every month, once a month. Um, and uh, we're now looking at the data. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't no. tell you what, what we found because <laughs> it's, we've just gotten right, the data. Right in the middle of it. Yeah. From this, uh, from that first assessment, which was uh, last week. Um, and when we talk again, I'll be able to let you know, but it'll be interesting. Anecdotally, mm -hmm. anecdotally, it appears that the socially anxious kids are actually doing better. How oh, interesting. Than their more exuberant, mm. socially outgoing peers. Which and intuitively, that sort of makes sense, right? Because yeah. Right. The exuberant outgoing peers want that social contact and mm -hmm. if they're missing it, even if they can get it on Zoom or, or Skype or Not whatever, that. it's still, you know, yeah. still missing from their lives. Whereas the socially anxious kids may be just fine mm -hmm. uh, with the type of contact that they're, that they're getting and that they can somehow control. Right. Which is a great... Um segue into my next question and do you have predictions for particularly for some of these at-risk children maybe the social the behaviorally inhibited but maybe uh now as you're saying other at-risk children uh more exuberant ones who aren't getting the social contact they need do you have predictions on what brain development might look like for them as a result of this pandemic well i'll tell you what <clears throat> Um, we are um, in general concerned about, which is that, uh, and that's not so much for our adolescent sample as much for um, some of our, in some of my other research with uh, families with preschoolers, toddlers, and, and infants, being uh, uh, sheltered in place uh, with your kids works uh, fine uh, for a little while, but over time uh, it may become a significant stressor 
in family relationships. Mm -hmm. And what we are concerned about, particularly in our at-risk samples, is that we may be, uh, we may not be seeing right now, but may see, as, uh, if you will, as a second wave, an increase in family violence and, mm -hmm. and maltreatment yes. as a result of being in small quarters Yes. and being unable to to get out. We don't know that for a fact yet, but yeah. I'm involved in some uh, data collection, which seems to suggest that, that that may be happening. Yes, and I know that's a, a, since the beginning has been a big concern here at the Child Study Center as well. Uh, right. Not only have potentially increased child abuse, but domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and just the effects of witnessing those kinds of things on children. Um, and then related, when schools are closed and you have people like teachers or other educators who may be reporters, uh, who are now no longer able to report, have been seeing um, some pretty comprehensive articles about how reports of domestic violence and child abuse are actually going down. Um, and uh, one, Predicted reason is that you don't have the the school environment uh, or educators or other caregivers um, to be reporting these kinds of things, and it's just it's really very concerning. Very That's right. The emergency rooms are dealing with COVID. Yes. And so bringing a child in may be, you know, less likely at this moment right. than it would have been uh, would have been earlier. So right. we just don't know and. Mm -hmm. uh, have to wait, wait and see. But it is a, a concern. I think the other issue is that, you know, I'll speak for myself. I have it easy. I can work remotely right now. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certainly families for whom uh, employment yes. uh, is a significant issue and unemployment mm -hmm. is uh, a significant issue or having to go out and because they're considered essential workers. Uh, and it becomes difficult in terms of like, what do you do with your kids? Or, you know, what's, what happens with childcare? Um, so these are issues that I think we, as, uh, you know, psychologists interested in the health and welfare of children need to be, you know, concerned about. Yes. Right. Um, you mentioned, you were talking about how uh, extended time at home but you know, with caregivers and children, could eventually become a a stressor. Um, so, given that largely parents and other caregivers are the ones now home with the kids, what do you think they can do if they're concerned about their children right now? Um, if they're concerned about uh, their children, maybe in terms of if they know they have a kid that may be prone to anxiety or um, at risk for for other concerns. What do you think that they might be able to do right now while they're at home? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. I'm hoping, I hope that the answer is that the Yale Child Study Center is at least, if not providing, uh, developing online resources mm -hmm. for families that they can, that they can tap into. I think that that's incredibly important. We're asking those questions of our adolescent and uh, families for them, but for younger children, yeah. we're, you know, we're not doing that. And I think uh, having those resources and getting out the word that those resources may be available right. Right. Uh, is, is quite important. I got, I'll give you just as an irony, I got a, an email yesterday from my uh, primary care physician mm -hmm. saying that his practice um, had available uh, Zoom mm -hmm. visits mm -hmm. if if one needed them. Well, it seems to me that we need that the, that kind of resource for families. Yes, yes. Um, to have that availability with someone who they could talk to and deal with with regard to you know, the stress of having right. kids at home. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to tell you that it's been quite remarkable the speed with which the Child Study Center has been able to pivot to offering telehealth 
Uh, and the last report I saw, which I know now is a little bit outdated, um, was that we have successfully seen over 1,000 patients online since this began. Um, and that is very good, but I do think you hit the nail on the head with getting the word out that these services are available. And well, I'm not surprised when you have Linda Mays uh, <laughs> there that, that, that she's gotten that done, but that's great. Yeah. Well, the last question I have is what lessons do you think we can take from this pandemic in terms of protecting children's development um, to the next global crisis? Because there will be one eventually uh, whenever it unfolds. What do you think we can learn and do better to pre better prepare for a next big crisis? So I would say three things that are all probably obvious. The first is is that we need to be aware that very young children are affected mm -hmm. uh, by these situations and by this crisis, uh, albeit maybe in a different way, mm -hmm. but they are affected by that um, in terms of stress um, and in terms of their own feelings of safety and security. Mm -hmm. Um, one can imagine for a young child that uh, being able to know that their caregivers are there for them and are going to be safe yes. and not going to die or get sick is, you know, is a pretty important uh, uh, message that they need to have. So that's the first thing we need to be aware that we need to care and be uh, worried about young uh, children starting at a very, very early age. The second thing that I think this has taught us is that we need to be flexible mm -hmm. and we need to be able to pivot. Um, uh, it's very hard for creatures of habit. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and we all are, right? Mm -hmm. But we need to, to uh, use our frontal lobes to, to yeah. pivot and to uh, plan um, to successfully uh, uh, care for children. Sounds like that's what's going on at the Child Study Center, but that needs to be a national, bigger scale. if not an international, uh, international message. Um, and the third thing is that we also need to recognize that we as adults are subject to the stress and uncertainty, and we need to, to deal with that ourselves in terms of how we're communicating that to uh, children, young children, older children, adolescents, because uh, uh, this is a great time of uncertainty. Right. Uh, and we don't know yet how it's going to end. Right. Well, thank you for all of your insight. It's been a real pleasure having you here with us. And we are so looking forward to having you here in person absolutely as soon as we can. So I absolutely am looking forward to it as well. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you.